Hi, my name is Dr. Vincent Cassiano. I'm a board-certified family medicine physician as well as board-certified pain management physician. Uh, here to give you a lecture about back pain. I have no disclosures. My objectives are to explain some basic anatomy of the low back and describe uh, some of the most common low back conditions that I see and that you may have. Uh, and understand treatment options based on the common back complaints. So background, chronic back pain is super duper common. Uh, we see it in almost a quarter of the population worldwide, and it takes up a majority of um, primary care visits. And at least somewhere between 25% 80% of patients will have a recurrence at least once per year that will be seen in primary care. And mechanical low back pain is uh, tends to be a generalized term to describe back pain that arises from the spine, discs, or surrounding soft tissue and muscles. So in this lecture, there are a lot of different things that can cause back pain, but we're going to predominantly focus on lumbar radiculopathy, which means that low back pain that may start in your back and kind of go down your legs vertebrogenic back pain, which uh, can cause back pain that just kind of nags in the back. Spondylosis, which is a general term for essentially arthritis of the back, uh, and uh, sacroiliac joint pain. So there is currently an, two different paradigms used. One's an older paradigm, which is most commonly still used in primary care and um, non-spine specialties, and a new paradigm. And so the old paradigm was axial versus radicular. So the question was, if you go into your doctors, does your back pain hurt in your back or does it go down your leg? And so that is axial, meaning uh, along the axis of the spine, and radicular, meaning that it radiates down a leg. Um, typically, axial back pain is thought to be due to the facets, which are the joints of the spine. Um, it could be due to the disc uh, if you have what's what's been deemed as discogenic pain or vertebrogenic pain. And radicular uh, goes down a leg, it's almost always due to nerve compression, and which is typically caused by uh, a bulging disc, but can be caused by other causes like a bone spur or um, enlarged ligaments of the spine. The newer paradigm is a little bit easier to understand from a functional standpoint. It has to do with anterior column versus posterior column and based off of what makes your back pain worse. Does it feel worse when you lean forward or lift from the ground? Does it feel worse when you lean backwards? And so this can help because it's been identified that you know anterior elements of your spine can cause both axial or radicular pain and posterior elements of your spine can cause both axial and radicular causes of pain. So it tends to be that the axial versus radicular question doesn't really give you a good answer about what the cause of your back pain is. So some basic anatomy. Um, what you have here is a lumbar model, right? So if we were to go and take off one of the vertebrae and look down the barrel, what you'd see is the disc. So the disc is essentially like a double layer jelly donut. You have a jelly center, which is what's called the nucleus propulsus, and you have the donut part, which is the annulus fibrosus. And so the annulus is two layered, and the outer layer does have some uh, nerve supply to it, so it can uh, cause some discomfort. But the inner layer, as well as the jelly part of the donut, do not have any uh, nerve endings to it. And so what typically happens over time is as through wear and tear, this outer layer becomes degraded. And as it becomes degraded, this jelly part starts to uh, push out against it. And so a double layered rubber gasket can be quite stiff and it kind of compresses the jelly into the center. But as these uh, rubber gaskets wear out over time, they get thinner. And as it gets thinner, then rubber tends to be more floppy and it gives an opportunity for the jelly to escape. Right here would be your spinal cord, which actually only exists down typically to your um, L1-2, which is high in the lower part of your back, just kind of underneath the ribs. And your spinal nerves that come off of that and go down into your leg. 
All right, now in the posterior portion, you have your facet joints, which would be back here. And you have what's called your neuroforamen, which is neuro meaning nerve, foramen meaning Latin for window. So the windows where your nerves leave. So in these windows, the nerve exits. All right, and so, and you can see from top to bottom, this is kind of the evolution of a disc. And it starts out thick and plump and healthy. The disc starts to degenerate, and as it degenerates, it becomes uh, floppy walled, and so your jelly starts to push out both forward and backward. Um, what you do not see here is you have a really rigid ligament on the front part of the spine that kind of holds the jelly in place in the front, so it kind of preferentially forces it out the back. As that disc starts to continue to wear out, the jelly starts to escape posteriorly, and this is kind of where your bulging nerves can encounter the nerve in your back uh, in the foramen and cause pain in your legs. The secondary thing people don't think about is this disc, in addition to providing, um, uh, providing shock absorption, can also provide space, so joint space for the facets. So as that gets flatter and wears out, you actually start to lose the space in your facets and you start to grind on your joints and you can develop bone spurs. So you can see as this space here actually starts to narrow because you're getting bone spurs in the back. And so over time, you go from thick, healthy disc, which is your shock absorber, which gives you these big open foramen. And over time it gets flattened and you can bulge some disc into the front, which can pinch your nerve, and you also decrease the size of your foramen because you get bone spurring on the back. So when you take a line and draw it down the foramen, everything in front is called the anterior column, which is largely your vertebral body, which is shaped like a marshmallow, and your discs. So when you are with really good posture and you're standing up nice and straight, 75% of the weight of your, uh, your torso uh, falls on the anterior column. When you lean forward to sit or bend forward to lift things off the ground or bend over to tie your shoes, what you tend to do is you shift more of that weight onto the anterior elements of your spine. And so instead of 75% of the weight, you may have up to 90% of the weight leaning on the anterior portion of your spine. So if you have pain that worsens when you lean forward, that's your anterior column pain. And then we have to figure out whether it's your bone or your disc causing the pain. When you lean back, that 25% of the weight you experience on your uh, facets will go up to 40%. And so leaning back, twisting, side bending, all of that kind of offloads the disc and puts the load on the facets. And so you'll end up with posterior column pain which most typically is due to uh, arthritis of the, of the facets. All right, so going into anterior column pain first, which we've kind of explained already. Here you have your anterior elements. This is an x-ray, so x-rays don't show the disc well. They do show the bones really well. And so when you go into flexion, you load, you actually open the joints in the back and you load the discs in the front. And so if you have anterior column pain, your pain will worsen when you bend forward. Uh, the pain may worsen when you come up from bending forward too. That's very, very common where people who are lifting from the ground experience worse pain. Um, you may get it also when you rise from a seated position. It's because we tend to lean forward when we rise from a seated position and prolonged sitting, especially with poor posture, actually bends the back and loads the anterior column uh, elements as well. And that can cause significant pain. So your anterior column pain causes tend to be lumped largely into two categories, discogenic or vertebrogenic. Discogenic meaning it comes from the discs, vertebrogenic meaning it comes from the vertebral body portion of your spine. Your discogenic cause can actually be axial or radicular. So your axial pain, meaning just in the back, can typically be caused by something like an annular fissure. So an annular fissure is a tear in the annulus. So a tear in that, uh, in that jelly donut. And you can actually see these on MRI. They come up as white specks or white linear uh, marks, and that is a tear. And so what you can have is a little bit of this goo that you have right here in the center as your nucleus propulsus. It's actually caustic. 
So it's unclear whether it directly burns or causes an inflammatory reaction that then hurts. Uh, but this goo belongs in the center of that donut. It comes out of that donut and it burns. So if you have a small hole, you might leak some of that goo periodically, especially if you do an activity like lifting from the ground of something heavy. And when that leaks out, it's going to cause pain in your back. If that goo leaks out onto a nerve, it's going to cause pain that can go down a nerve. If you have a big bulging disc, that big bulging disc can go and press into a nerve and cause pain. For tebergenic pain, it tends to be pain that actually comes from the bones itself. And so for tebergenic pain, uh, you can see this on MRI as well because you have all this inflammatory um, markings in an MRI. And so again, this jelly wants to push in every direction at once when you stress the spine. It wants to go forward, it wants to go backwards, and it wants to go into the vertebral uh, bodies themselves. You have a really strong ligament in the front that stops it from going forward most times. The back does not actually have a very strong ligament, and so when you have disc bulges, they tend to go out that way. Now, you would think that the bone of a vertebral body is super hard, and it is somewhat around it. So if you look at this like a marshmallow, the ring around the sides of the marshmallow are actually very hard, but the end plates are not very hard. And the reason for that is, as we discussed earlier, the center of the disc does not have a blood supply. So it gets all its nutrients by diffusing across this surface and the surface is porous, kind of like a pumice stone. So if you have a hard load or you work a job that's man, a, lot, a lot of manual labor or lifting kind of thing, I see this in the military population all the time, what happens is you actually disrupt the end plate to the vertebral body and some of this jelly leaks out and causes this massive inflammatory reaction. Not everybody feels this, but probably 80 plus percent of people do feel this. And it feels like a horrible pain directly in their back worse with bending forward because you're loading that joint or you're loading those uh, vertebral bodies and worse with lifting from the ground and it does not go down the leg. And this would typically be what I would describe as a anterior column axial back pain. And if on the MRI you see these inflammatory signs of the vertebral bodies, it's kind of a slam dunk for vertebrogenic pain. So as we discussed earlier with some of the anatomy, you have this jelly donut that has two rings around it and those thick rubber rings hold the jelly in place. As that outer ring wears out, it becomes thinner and this jelly that was compressed in the center now has freedom of motion to move around. So your disc is fluid. And so if you bend forward, you push the disc contents backwards. If you bend backwards, you push them forward. If you bend to the right, you push them to the left and vice versa. And so what ends up happening is now that you have a, a fluid pushing against a thin rubber wall, it can push backwards into spinal nerve elements and cause pain that goes down your leg. And if you have a tear, like this is your annular fissure, you can actually leak some of that substance out and it could press directly onto a nerve and cause pain or it can leak and cause an inflammatory back, uh, back pain that goes down your leg. And if it were to kind of bust through this end plate, you can cause an acute and even chronic inflammation of the vertebral body that can be quite painful. So let's talk about treatment options then. So if you have a degenerated disc that is causing you pain, uh, specifically nerve pain. The most common treatments for that are neuropathic agents, things like gabapentinoids. So you may see this as gabapentin, pregabalin, Lyrica, Neurontin. These are all trade names and generic names for a, a drug family called gabapentinoids. These guys work really, really well, particularly for pain that leaves your back and goes down your legs. It works okay for back pain uh, because people's back pain is typically mixed. Usually there's a little bit of muscular pain, a little bit of joint pain, a little bit of nerve pain. And so these medications work well for the nerve pain component. So you may have a huge relief of leg pain and a relatively minor relief of back pain, which is pretty typical with medications like gabapentin or uh, pregabalin. There are also tricyclic antidepressants that work really well for nerve pain. 
and some SNRIs, which are antidepressants that also work well on pain. Your biggest side effect profile you're going to have with both your gabapentin noise and your TCA is going to be sedation. So people tend to get sleepy on these medications and they don't like it because of that. Uh, gabapentin, or sorry, uh, pregabalin or Lyrica tends to do better about sedation. Epidural steroid injections work well, but again, work best for disc bulges that cause nerve pain. And the reason for that, again, uh, we discussed in other lectures, your pain is caused because you have an, a tissue injury. It releases inflammatory substances and those cause inflammation. Well, epidural steroid washes those away and leaves the steroid behind to act as a local anti-inflammatory. And they typically work really well and they give people good relief. The relief from an epidural steroid typically lasts somewhere between three to six months. Most people get about three months. If you're using just an epidural steroid, it's your only treatment for your disc pain. Uh, some people who do lots of other things, lots of stretching, yoga, medications, they've fixed their, um, they've fixed their workplace ergonomics, they can get up to a year of relief with an epidural. Intradiscal therapies have been tried where they go and they will actually place a needle into the disc itself to deliver medication. There's good evidence that steroids do not work when placed into the disc as opposed to the epidural space. Um, there is some emerging evidence about putting biologics into the disc itself, whether that be um, whether that be PRP, which is a substance that you can get out of your own blood, uh, whether that be uh, biologics from other cadaveric uh, sources of nucleus propulsus, so essentially getting a cadaver's nucleus propulsus and injecting it. Um, this is emerging evidence and it's largely industry sponsored, so I can't recommend for or against. Uh, I have heard colloquially patients do really well with it. The epidural space, again, is not the disc. It's just the space around the spinal nerves. And when you place it, it can wash away the inflammatory substances. And with the intradiscal therapies, they would actually be entering into the disc itself. NSAIDs are unlikely to be very effective for uh, discogenic pain, but they can be very effective for uh, pain that comes from the joints or pain that comes from muscles. Topicals are less likely to be effective just because of how deep they need to go to get to the, the disc. And topicals typically penetrate somewhere between a quarter to half an inch. So it may get through your skin and into some of the muscles, but it's not going to get deep enough to affect the discs. For vertebrogenic pain, uh, and this is a diagram here and then MRI evidence. Uh, this is what we were talking about before, where you have your vertebral bodies, which look like marshmallows. The hard part, again, is the ring around it. The soft part is the end plates. And so you can have defects in the end plates due to trauma or you know, heavy exercise or falling down on, uh, onto your seat or any number of things. And you can get defects in the end plates or in the corners of the end plates or just kind of erode it. And what you'll see is these inflammatory reactions that happen around this. Now, whether this is, again, the nucleus propulsus being directly caustic or it causing an inflammatory reaction is still unknown, but it seems to be that in about 80 to 90% of people who have these images on their MRI and they have pain that is anterior column, axial back pain, it's usually the vertebrogenic pain that causes them pain. Now, the treatment for this uh, is NSAIDs to start, which uh, can be modestly helpful, but tend to not give a, a significant enough relief for people to be functional on it. There is one procedure, and this is not an advertisement for Intercept. This is a procedure I do. Uh, I find it is very, very helpful for my patients, but I, I receive no money or funding from Intercept. The, it is an ablation of a nerve, that nerve is your basal vertebral nerve. That nerve comes in through the back of the vertebral body and then branches up and down and feeds the end plates of that vertebral body. You enter into the bone with a trocar and then you put a RFA probe, a radiofrequency ablation probe, at the base of that nerve and you burn it. 
And when you do that, you actually get very durable relief. Um, the studies go out to five years. There'll be a study, roughly eight year data coming out soon, and that'll likely show the same thing. And the reason for that is the nerves in your body function very similar to a power cord. You have the, uh, the center of the power cord, which is the copper portion, and that transmits the electrical signal. In our, uh, in our bodies, the center of our nerves is what transmits the electrical signal. And then we have a covering over top of it called myelin, kind of like a power cable has a rubber covering to work as an insulation. When you injure a nerve, typically the, the two ends of the injured nerve, the myelin will grow back together and then it will fill in the nerve over time. And that typically takes between six and 24 months before the nerve heals. Most people about a year. That myelin does not exist inside of the bone. So when you do this ablation uh, for the intercept procedure, it, it tends to give people very, very good results of relief of anterior column, axial back pain in the presence of the signs on MRI where they show, uh, they show inflammation of the bone. And it tends to be durable, meaning that it lasts. Right now, the studies are five years likely they're permanent at that level because the nerves natural ability to heal does not exist inside the bone um, there are topical options you can try to use but it's unlikely that topicals get deep enough to provide any kind of relief because as talked about before they only penetrate about a quarter to a half an inch deep um, epidural steroid injections tend to be very very transient uh, the relief because the nerve enters in through the back of the vertebral body, which means it initiates kind of like in the epidural space. So you do an epidural injection on these folks, they get like two, three days of relief, and then the symptoms come right back. And that's very, very common. If you want more uh, information on Intercept, you can follow the, follow the link there and you can get more patient in, uh, information on Intercept. Again, in my patient population, this tends to work very, very robustly uh, and um, durably. So now kind of shifting to posterior column pain. Again, this is pain in your back that is worse with extension, rotation, or side bending because it causes facet loading. And it could also be worse when you lay flat on your back because when you lay flat on your back, you tend to be more in extension. These guys tend to feel better when they lean forward because when you lean forward, you take the pressure off of your facets and you put it onto your anterior column. So for every joint in your body, whether it be a finger knuckle or it be in your spine, what you have is you have the bone. On the end of the bone, you have hyaline cartilage, which is the cartilage of the, of the joint. Then you have a joint space, and then you have the cartilage on the other side of the bone. What happens over time with arthritis is you lose that joint space. And when you lose that joint space, your cartilage starts to rub. And hyaline cartilage or joint cartilage is actually asensate. It has no sensation. But as you start to erode and rub away that cartilage, it'll expose the bone underneath, which is actually quite sensitive. And it's akin to driving on tires. And as the rubber wears out, you start to see the belt metal underneath. And once that belt is exposed, you know your tire is long past overdue for when it needs to be replaced. And in your back, once that belt is exposed, you're going to start to experience pain. And that really goes for every joint in your body. Now, again, your disc's job, part of it is to maintain that joint space. So as that disc degenerates and flattens out, you're going to lose that joint space and you're going to start grinding your cartilage and develop arthritis. So how do you treat arthritis? The, ma the mainstay of arthritic spine pain is NSAIDs, period, the end. Tylenol, Motrin, or ibuprofen, um, Aleve, or naproxen, Mobic, or Meloxicam, like all these medications, their job is to decrease inflammation of the joint and to decrease uh, the chemicals that cause pain. Physical therapy is super important because as the muscles become, uh, as the joint pain gets worse, the muscles start to deactivate and you start to use them less and you'll start to develop atrophy of the muscles around those joints, which only makes things worse because as the muscles get weak, um, you can't maintain joint stability as well and you tend to get more rattling of the joints and more pain. 
from an inter, uh, interventional standpoint, let's say you've done your NSAIDs and you've done your physical therapy, uh, nerve ablation is probably the way to go. Uh, this is a two-step process. So as we discussed in other videos, the way pain is transmitted through the body is through nerves. So if you were to stick a pin in your thigh, it hurts only if the nerves transmit that information up to your brain to be interpreted as pain. So what you have is these little nerves called medial branch nerves, and they send the pain signal up through to the spinal cord up to the brain to be interpreted as pain. So typically what you do, a two-step process, first you would need to do a medial branch block. So what you would do is at each level of concern, you put a very small amount of anesthetic uh, under fluoroscopic guidance and essentially giving you a numb joint. And you walk around for a few hours with those numb joints and see whether or not they give you significant relief of your complaint symptom, which would be usually pain when you lean back or you twist or side bend. Um, most insurance companies require you to repeat this to make sure it wasn't a false positive. And so if twice you go to your pain doc and twice they've done a medial branch block on you and twice you've gotten really good response, uh, then it follows with a medial branch nerve ablation, which is a radio frequency ablation. Uh, the relief can last between six and 24 months. Most people get somewhere between six and 12 months of relief out of it because unlike the nerves inside the bone that don't have the ability to recover, these nerves do. And so these nerves typically recover, but it takes about six to 12 months to recover. And when they do recover, your back pain with leaning back or twisting returns. And this is a picture from uh, Stryker, uh, just because it gives you a good idea of what we do with the, with the ablations. This is not an advertisement for Stryker. The radio frequency ablations can actually be done with several different kinds of equipment. And depending on your doc, uh, they're going to have different equipment available to them. Finally, we'll end with uh, sacroiliac joint arthritis. So this one is really, really tough. X-rays are not necessarily helpful uh, to diagnose it. MRIs uh, can be helpful if there's suspicion of an inflammatory condition like psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or something like that. Uh, but otherwise, MRIs are also not very helpful for diagnosing SI joint arthritis. Most commonly, the way it is diagnosed is with history and physical exam. And some of the history may be very, very similar to that of um, low back arthritis because things like extension can cause pain there. Here's an x-ray, uh, which you know does not demonstrate, there's not clear from left side to right side which one of these sides actually has arthritis. So x-rays are not necessarily uh, advised for the purpose of diagnosing. Now you can get an x-ray to rule out other causes. Here's an MRI and this MRI actually shows an inflammatory sacroiliac joint arthritis, probably from a patient with psoriatic arthritis. And you can see when there's inflammation in the bone, it tends to light up brightly on a, a T2-weighted MRI, as opposed to the other side that remains dark. So the way you treat an SI joint arthritis is typically with NSAIDs. Uh, like most arthritis, uh, NSAIDs are first-line therapy. Uh, physical therapy can be helpful for reasons we discussed before. You can do an SI joint steroid injection, uh, which gives you relief from three to six months, depending on uh, how your body processes that steroid. You'll notice that the steroid injection was not an option offered for lumbar facet arthritis. And it's not offered because there's studies that show that uh, steroid injection of the facet joints actually wears them out faster and they tend to give you a worse outcome. Um, they're the lateral branch nerve ablation. So very, very similar to uh, your lumbar spine where first you would do a branch block, but this one of the SI joints of lateral branches. So you do the lateral branch block. If you get good relief, you follow it again. You do a lateral branch block. If you get good relief again, then you can burn these nerves as they exit the foramen. Again, foramen is Latin for window. As these nerves exit the window, you can burn the nerves and that should give you a numb SI joint. 
uh, relief again can last between six and 24 months. Most people get six to 12 months. The only caveat here is that there are several insurance companies that do not cover SI joint lateral branch ablations. So if you have a recalcitrant SI joint pain that continues on despite all the other therapies recommended, like you know steroid injections and ablations if your insurance company will cover it, there's SI joint fusion. So fusion therapy, uh, typically performed by orthospine, classically involves having two to three large screws that traverse the, the iliac bone and the sacrum and they lock it in place. And when you lock a joint in place, it tends to not hurt because uh, if you don't have the joint gliding past each other, then it, it, you know, it shouldn't hurt. Uh, this surgery is uh, pretty significant having three large screws go through, as you can imagine, and you can have post-operative pain with it because they have to go through the meat of your hip to get down to the bone. There's an alternative minimally invasive SI joint fusion called the LINK procedure, and this is from Pain Tech, where they enter in minimally invasively through the posterior uh, side of your hip, kind of like where you would get an SI joint injection, and they place this almond-sized um, almond sized implant, which largely has essentially, for lack of a better term, like a concrete in the center of it. And that keeps the joint gapped, because if the joint doesn't rub, it doesn't hurt. So it keeps it gapped, and it locks it in place in a gapped position. And this has pretty good evidence for it. And again, this is not an advertisement for pain tech or the link procedure. I'm just providing you information based off of uh, my current practice. So there are other important back pain diagnoses that don't neatly fit into what we've discussed already. And that'd be things like spondylolysis with or without spondylolisthesis, spondylolisthesis, and neurogenic claudication. Uh, and these are things we'll discuss in further videos. So I don't wanna get bogged down with it because probably the things we've discussed already between the anterior and posterior column, axial and radicular pains, probably covers 85% of back pain that is difficult to treat. We'll cover those other diagnoses in subsequent videos. Uh, this is Dr. Cassiano. There's my references. I hope you found this video helpful and stay well.